listen to the murmurs of the land, to the whispers of the range. Listen to the calls of the wild. There was a time when this country had no other voice. desolate old country, hmm? The open spaces. Well, they're open, all right. Takes a lot of country anymore just to graze a cow. Well, uh, there's a neighbor or two down the road, about 30 miles. But most everybody passed this country by. Well, I can't say that I blame them much. This old range runs from about the border of Canada to the edge of Texas. About 170 million acres. Jackarabbits and brush. Well, it's about the last of America's land between New York and San Francisco, anyway. The rest of the country's all been taken up. Hard to believe? Well, it shouldn't be. Been coming on for a long time now. Once we had a lot more land than we knew what to do with. Clear from the Missouri River west. Indian country, mostly. The Indians lived close to the land, grass and the water. Their problems were pretty simple. When the buffalo moved on, so did the Indians. They didn't do much to develop the land, simply used it as they found it. There was plenty of land, grass, buffalo. We had a lot of open land then and not so many people. When other people started coming west, the look of the land began to change. Yeah, pioneers in the west, one of the great romances of history. There was plenty of room for everybody for the farmers from the rocky lands, the clerks, cooks, the bookkeepers, any man looking for a fresh start in life. There was land for the asking, more than a man could use. Good land. Those men and women were a pretty rugged bunch of people. The land was free, but they gave a lot to get it, more than money. Oregon or bust was their motto. Oregon was 2,000 miles from their jumping off place on the Missouri River. Five months of travel at best. 2,000 miles through plains, mountains, and deserts. The stop was dangerous to settle down suicide. But in only about four years, around 1842, 10,000 people came west over the old Oregon Trail. Here and there, you can still see the ruts left by their wagons. All those people came through this country, but darn few of them stopped. They kept right on to the coast. That was their promised land. The government gave land to other men coming west, the homesteaders. Homesteader had to build a house, work the land, and live on it. If he did, it was his, and he could claim it for his own. About all the homesteader had were his family, his own two hands, and a chance to make good. Well, we 
Probably had an old sodbuster plow too, but not much more. Seems to me that the whole progress of the West started with those people. They did something with the land itself. The one hope they had was to improve the land. They had to do it to survive. There weren't too many odds in their favor. Sometimes they weren't too welcome. Those days are gone now. There just isn't any more homesteading available. The trail herds were out west before the homesteaders. Cattle falling from Mexico to Canada. Man could carve a fortune out of cattle and grass, and a lot of them did. There were wild cattle all over the country. All you had to do was round them up and get them to market. There was grass and water and not a fence in sight. roots and all. When the grass died out, the winds took the moisture out of the land. And the face of that land wasn't real green again for a mighty long time. Yeah, it's easy enough to blame the trail herds now. But who worried about the land then? Least of all the trail drovers. There were other things. Like a town at the end of the trail. Man could shake off the dust, get a bath and a haircut, forget the herds for a while. Once in a while, the fun got a little lively. Uh, the West made a name for itself, sure enough. But probably what changed its landscape more than anything was building the railroads west of the Mississippi. The iron horse cut off weeks from the journey. It was hardly 10 years until the population west of the Mississippi had doubled. The open spaces came alive with farmers, ranchers, miners, businessmen. Congress and President Lincoln granted millions of acres of public lands to the railroads to get them to link up the Atlantic and the Pacific. The railroads took up quite a stretch of land every other section along the right of way. It was a good marriage and it produced some real progress. Fact is, the railroads raised the value of the whole West. They wanted their lands to be settled as soon as possible. So a settler could buy good land for only $3 to $10 an acre. More than 140,000 square miles of land were given to the transcontinental railroads to help finance construction. So the land and the iron horse made it possible to open up the frontier. New markets opened up for the factories of the East and the West started coming into its own. As the West expanded its enterprise, the availability of its land became a little less. Then again, a little less. Few people noticed. The West was growing, wasn't it? What was really growing was the number of people in the West. Some of the old cow trails are main streets now. Some of the old homesteads gave way to brick and mortar, concrete and asphalt. And it seems to me that's as it should be.
Since the first settlers stuck a plowshare into the ground, we've been a nation of doers. The growth of the West has never been automatic. Somebody always had to do something with the land or, or to the land. Cities are just over those hills, but they aren't for me anymore. Out here, a uh, man can roam around a little. Uh, this country's just sitting here, waiting for tomorrow. Well, all the West was waiting land once, and not all of it was ideal by a long shot. Oh, sure, the best lands are all taken up now, but some of these old open spaces are worth a lot more than you might think. Some people aren't waiting. They're doing something about it. One thing, the brush that's been choking the range for years is being killed off. Trouble with sagebrush is the, the roots take all the moisture out of the ground. What little there is, and the grass doesn't have a chance. And I'll tell you, that can make the cupboard pretty bare for the cattle and sheep. In some places, part of the brush, like bitter brush, is left for the wild animals. They use it for cover and, and browse. The brush isn't very useful to the stockman. Grass, that's what he's looking for. Grass on the range is for more than cows, though. One big reason is a cover of grass to protect the topsoil. Once it's gone, Nobody can do much about getting it back. It takes Mother Nature thousands of years. The Bureau of Land Management of the Department of the Interior set up a project to show what can be done with a range that's in poor shape. It covered about five million acres here in eastern Oregon. They picked a tough one, all right. Some of us sort of wondered at first, but I'll tell you, the job they're doing looks pretty good to me. It's the biggest range project ever undertaken, called the Vale Project, named for a little town nearby. In some areas where all the grass is gone anyway, the ground is plowed up to get rid of the sagebrush. Then the range has a fresh start. It'll be good grassland again, one of these days. Ground is seeded to highly drought-resistant grass. Makes good livestock forage, too. Sometimes, say in the city, it's easy to overlook the fact that about all the progress that the nation has made was somehow related to the land, but was done with the land. You can trace a lot of wealth back to the earth. I'd say it's worth caring for. Some of its bounty can be renewed, like timber grown for sustained yields. New grass can be seeded. But when the topsoil, that little skin of productive earth is gone, it's a different story. Not much use starting over then. Grass cover retains moisture and helps keep the soil in place. There's little enough rainfall on this plateau country anyway. And sometimes when the rain does fall, it comes on the run. If there's no ground cover to stop it, part of the soil goes along with the runoff. Some places have been badly damaged over the years. Cloud bursts and flash floods can cut deep gullies before you know it.
Even little rivulets of water can peel off a barren hillside. And the hills can't cure themselves. Erosion from wind and water is a sort of never-ending thing. But it can be controlled. There are lots of methods. But out on the open range, ground cover and improved waterways are the best medicines. Then the rain can penetrate the soil. The excess groundwater goes on back to the sea. A cover of sagebrush can't stop the runoff of the rain. Too many bare spots. <laughs> a cow can get poor as a snake looking for grass out here. They walk off any gain they put on. It's about the same for water. And if there's little grass, there's usually not much water around. You wonder how some of the animals managed, especially the wild ones. Well, it's different now, but the first couple of years there, the project needed patience from everybody concerned. Me too. You can bet some of the old timers complained a little when their stock had to be kept off the range for a while. That's to say, where the seedings were. There wouldn't be much left and nothing flat. The cattlemen and the sheepmen have used this range since the West began, almost. So uh, if a man has to take his stock off the range for a bit. That can be a little hard to understand. All the animals have to be kept off the newly seeded areas for about two years. The range seedings are not just for cattle and sheep, true enough, but grazing is a mighty big factor. Some places where the grass isn't too bad, it's possible to get it into first-class shape just by keeping the animals off it. Then the native grasses can grow up and reseed themselves. Actually, maybe 80% of the range can be managed so that it'll reseed itself. That's a long way from the old days when stock was turned loose helter-skelter. And it's paying off, even now. Overuse by livestock isn't easy to spot just by guess. So now the range gets a round of sampling at regular intervals. Tells you what the grass is doing, improving or not. I wonder what some of the real old timers, like my granddad, would think. But they found out what poor range can mean. There's only about 10 inches of rainfall a year out here and water is mighty precious. Even a trickle can be a gold mine in some places. A spring is a real bonanza for both livestock and game. There are quite a few new reservoirs on the old range now to catch the rainwaters. They help control erosion and make for dry season watering places also. You can't rope off the land just to save it for the future. You have to use it. The livestock industry is pretty important to about everybody. Steak and hamburger are two pretty good reasons. The stock will be turned onto the new grass in time, and when they are, they'll become better beeves for sure. The old range isn't going to look the same around here. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Where there's no water source handy, they build one. That keeps cattle from tromping all over the range, looking for a spring or a creek. If 
pipelines laid under the ground run to watering tanks, not so much for the convenience of steers, but for less wear and tear on the range grass. To anybody's guess as to what this land might be used for in the next century, 100 years ago, who'd have guessed we'd have today's population? Right now, though, this land's best suited to grazing range. True enough, it may not be the best land in the world, but the time's here when we have to take a second look at the places others passed by. It takes a little doing, all right, but the project was set up to show what can be done with a land like this. And I figure it for a little more than that, though. If you can save the topsoil and improve the range at the same time, how can you lose? They figure that uh, after everything's in shape, the range will be able to support three times the number of animals that was possible before. Maybe more. I believe them, too. Now. Well, there are a lot of improvement areas on the project, like out south of here. Used to be good range country down there once, years ago. Grass knee high to a steer. Just got used so hard, there's nothing much left now. About the first job is to get a road built into the site. And there are a lot of sites, sort of checkerboarding the range now. Roads have a lot of uses. For one thing, range fires could get entirely out of control if there's no access for men and firefighting equipment. Fires are always a threat on the range. The damage they create can be serious indeed, and not only to the cattle, but wildlife as well. After a fire, land is exposed to just about all the ravages of nature, weeds, floods, and erosion. Well, I guess there's more to life than brush, grass, and cattle. For me, anyway, there's the other side of the coin, some place to get away. Maybe that's why I stay out here, I don't know. Sometimes when you look across the open spaces, the money side of things seems to get a little lost. There are other values for me too, the, the closeness to the earth, the world of nature. Well, like they say, the whole community that shares the land. prospect of, of a dollars and cents return in recreation. But there is our heritage of the great outdoors. And there's a chance to return for a while to the real values that helped build our nation. I suppose the vistas of open country have always challenged the imagination. First, there was just the land. Then the imagination and willingness of people surging toward the west. Even from its beginnings, the growth of this great nation has always been coupled to its lands. 
and its growth has always outstripped the most optimistic predictions. Once, a little over a hundred years ago, there was the untamed frontier, stretching westward 2,000 miles from the Mississippi. There were the settlers, the cow outfits, the homesteaders. Now there is this waiting heritage. About the only public lands left in the West for tomorrow. These lands can't help themselves. There'll be many more Americans tomorrow. I guess one thing that made this nation great is the wealth waiting in the land, below and above the surface. But growth and progress didn't just happen in the West. Somebody always had to come along first and do something with the land. Naturally, what we do for this waiting land today will surely influence what we can do tomorrow.